Well, Booktube, it's another day. It is a Monday morning. It's 6.15 in the morning. Uh, I woke up about 10 to, 10 to 5 this morning. The reason why is I went to bed at 10 o'clock last night. And if I go to bed, I only need about six, seven hours worth of sleep. So, I woke up around five o'clock and I just, my mind started spinning. So I laid there and laid there and I decided, well, I'll just get up because I can always, since I, I'm no longer in the work world, uh, I haven't worked for the last uh, I think I stopped working in 2007. Maybe, yeah. So I haven't worked for almost 10 years. So yeah, this year I turned 65 years old and that still freaks me out. So yeah, so the point is, is that I can always take a nap today if I get really sleepy. Usually I get sleepy around one o'clock. I'm more awake in the morning and then I get kind of tired in the around one o'clock and I start waking up around three, four o'clock. And that's the kind of point I'm trying to say is that uh, when it comes to reading, uh, people talk about reading slump. Well, I was listening to somebody yesterday on Booktube who went through a six-month reading slump because um, different things were going on in their life. Well, as I've said, I, I'm always reading uh, because, as I've said, being a Christian, you're always reading for, well, you ought to be if you're a Christian, you're always reading the Bible. And if you're a Christian, now, for you, those who know that I stopped going to church about 10, 11 years ago, not because I don't believe in church, it's just that I, I was just getting lonely and there was nobody to talk to. And maybe there were other reasons, lack of pastoral care, uh, anti-intellectualism, right-wing politics, uh, just different things. Uh, just I just wasn't getting any kind of co the communion of the saints. But the point is, if you're like, if you're really a, a Christian, <clears throat> a Christian lifestyle is that you you go to church on Sunday. Uh, churches that we have attended, you have morning service. They they read the Bible, a portion of scripture. And they preach from the Bible. They they go through in the churches that we belong to. They go through books of the Bible. They might preach through, for example, the Gospel of John, and they'll go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It might take them sometimes a year, two years to go through a book of the Bible. So you're always in the Bible. You're always reading the Bible. You're always studying the Bible. And then as a Christian. Uh, you have devotions every day. Every day you have a time when you sit down on your own. You might do it in the morning. You might, it just depends how your life is structured. You sit down in the morning and you read the Bible, you pray, and you read a devotional book. Uh, for me, I read these books in the morning. Like I, uh, this is 2017. This is January 2017. It is the second day of, of January 2017. Yeah. And so in the mornings, uh, I do. Uh, some people, they have all kinds of ways that people have devotions. My wife reads through the Bible. You know, she, she sings psalms. She has different things that she does in the morning. What I do is I read, I go through different books. And this is the book I mentioned, the book of Isaiah, God's Kingdom of Thematic Theological Approach by Andrew D. Abernathy. So I might read this one morning, 
Then the next morning I'll read Called by Triune Grace, Divine Rarick, and Effects Were Called by Jonathan Hogland. And then I'll read maybe another morning The Triune God by Fred Sanders. This is in the Doctrine of the Trinity. And then I'll read this book, Biblical Authority After Babel, Retrieving the Soul of the Spirit of Mere Protestant Christian by Kevin J. Vandehuser. And I've been reading this one, The Christian's Only Comfort in Life and Death, an Exposition Heidelberg Catechism, Volume 1, by Theodorus Vandergroove. And then I got this one out the other day, out of the lower level, The Money Cult, Capitalism, Christianity, and the Making of the Ameri the Unmaking of the American Dream, by Chris Lehman. So that's what I do. But then sometimes, like I'm having right now, your brain doesn't function. You, you can't read this stuff anymore because what happens with me is that my brain becomes stuffed. Uh, I can't get any more inside my brain and I'm that's why I'm feeling uh, right now uh, I just can't I can't read this stuff in the morning and so what do you do? So what I do is I just I just, like I've been just reading just a page of this, or a couple of paragraphs, or you look at a verse in the Bible, and that's what you do. Uh, sometimes you just have to sit in silence, and uh, I call it centering yourself. You, you focus on what is really real, what's really important every day, and, and you don't freak out. See, that's the thing. Sometimes you can get this idea, well, if I'm not just constantly thinking, I'm constantly in the state of intensity that something is wrong with you spiritually. No, sometimes we, we have our ups and downs. We have times when we, me personally, I, I go through times when I just my brain refuses to function and I can't read all this stuff and so I just I just let it all settle uh, I don't try to freak out and so like yesterday all I read yesterday in the mornings I just read a couple of pages out of this a couple of pages of Dutch Puritan Reformed theology and that was it and uh and I write in my diary today I'm on, on page page three of my January 2017 diary and you just kind of like uh, you just kind of drift um, yeah with me I don't have I don't go to church I don't go to Bible studies I don't go to Sunday school so I have to feed myself spiritually. But I've been a Christian since 1970. That doesn't mean that you just, you rest on your laurels. With me, if you're really spiritually alive, you have a spiritual thirst within you. You have a desire planted by God to seek after Him, to seek His face, and to live in His presence. And so, I always sense within myself, no matter what I'm going through, depression or anxiety or fear or sometimes I just, my brain doesn't function. I, but I always sense within myself the presence of God within me, the, the, my soul thirst after God. And I, I'm always, now sometimes people say, I don't know what to pray for. Well. You can pray to the Lord, Lord, give me a spiritual thirst. C continue to plant within me a, a desire to walk with you and, and to live into your presence and give me a desire to, to follow your will. And what is God's will? Well, God's will is that we, that we open ourselves up to his divine, his divine love and seek to live in the presence of God, which is... You know, God's a good God. You know, he's not. He's not just up there trying to make your life miserable. He wants 
the best things for us. He, he wants what is good for us. He doesn't want to just make our life a big bummer. He wants us to, to experience life, peace. Now, it's, that's, that's not meaning that if you're a Christian that your life isn't a void of, of trials. You might get cancer. Your kids might have a brain tumor. You might go through losing your job. You, you might go through war and having your city bombed. You might go through all kinds of horrible things. But the Lord says that he'd be with you through those, those dark times, those horrible times, those times of great sorrow and, and great suffering. Uh, like it says that when we we die, he'll wipe away all our tears. And he, the Bible doesn't kind of wish wash what life is. Life is hard. Life is difficult. Life is a struggle. But you don't go through it alone. Now, I personally wish I had a, a bunch of Christian friends, and I wish I had a solid church and a minister and elders who really cared for me and prayed for me and sought after my physical and spiritual good, but I don't. And maybe it's my own fault. Maybe it's it's me. It's not there. I'm not blaming anybody. Uh, we all fail. We're all sinners. We all fail to love and, and to reach out and care for one another. I'm just as guilty as anybody else. I'm not lifting myself up and saying, everybody is a hypocrite and I'm the only person that's righteous. No. We're all, we all fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. But we look to God's grace and His mercy. So, anyway, I just was saying that's uh, how it's going in the mornings here. As far as my devotional time, it's... I woke up this morning just feeling kind of brain dead and I just don't know if I can get into anything but don't freak out. So that's what I'm reading in the morning for devotions. I, I finished uh, the night mislaid by Neil Zink. Um, I, as I said, uh, I also finished last month Stone Arabia by Dana Spatola and I also finished this novel last month How Should a Person Be by Sheila Hittit and I finished The Castaway Lounge last month, John Bollard, and I finished The Wanting Seed by Anthony Burgess. Now, none of these novels really just blew me away. But I wanted to say that when I, I, I started reading this a long time ago, and I just finished it. I think I started this way back in the summer of 2016. And I wasn't really that impressed. Uh, I had read uh, before her, her first novel by Neil Zink, The Walk Reaper. And I was really kind of, ah, oh, you know, it's not too bad. But I don't know why it got all this rave. It was, just, it was just got all this attention and great book reviews. But when I read it, I wasn't that impressed. So then I, I ordered, right, I, I ordered this one, her next novel, Mislaid. And, I wasn't really impressed. And then I just put it aside. And then I read these two. And then I picked up Miss Late again and I said, wow, if this is the kind of genre of writing that is going on right now among women writers, she's a lot better than these two women. She, uh... Now this one... This one is, I put this one, number one, number two, and number three. Now, of course, they're all different, but in a, cer in a certain sense, they're the same. I call them hipster novels. Uh, women who are really smart, really intelligent, they know how to write, they know how to communicate, it's not novels in the traditional sense. It's more, like I said, it's slice of life. Uh, but uh, 
I would recommend if you want some modern kind of it's not a novel but if you want a good story well I don't know a good story a good hipster novel mislaid it's not bad this is okay this really sucked <laughs> but then I uh, I had ordered this by uh, Neil Zink it's called Private Novelist and what this is is that before Neil Zink got popular she started I think she was first published in her when she was 50 years old but she wrote this no, uh, novel for a friend of hers that she knew when she was married and lived in Israel and uh, so I started reading this yesterday uh, I'm kind of curious what she wrote before she became well known in the literary world and uh, so I'm reading this so that's what's going on here in my book world. I don't know, like I said, I'm kind of in a, my mind's kind of tired, my intellect's kind of tired. I'm kind of, I suppose I'm just going to have to rest my brain. But I'm always reading something. You just read a little bit. So yeah, so I hope you have a good week and today's Tuesday and time goes by. And uh, thank for the new subscribers. Feel free to ask me questions. Tell me what you're reading. Tell me what you think about modern feminist literature or what you think about anything. Just feel free to comment. Till next time, bye.